Hey guys, welcome back. So many of us will have seen or heard horror stories about nuclear energy, be it Chernobyl, Fukushima in Japan. Nuclear energy tends to make people quite nervous. And I've recently been looking into this topic because like many people, I was fairly ignorant about the subject. But this week, I had the pleasure to speak with a nuclear energy proponent from the UK. His name is Colin Megson. Now, Colin was born in 1938. His early years were spent in Yorkshire. He passed his 11 plus and went to grammar school in 1950. With seven GCSEs, he went to the pit or the coal mines uh, about half a mile away and got an apprenticeship in mechanical engineering. Colin spent a total of nine years with the National Coal Board and obtained decent higher national certificates crucial to understanding energy thermodynamics and materials. In 1964, Colin joined Rolls-Royce and Associates in the design section of their R&D department. Rolls-Royce manufactured the nuclear reactors for the UK nuclear submarine fleet. Then in 1970, he moved back to Leeds where he lives now and served with several engineering companies before moving into design, costing and procurement of high pressure hydraulic plant and equipment. Colin retired at age 70 in 2008 with experience of Lloyd's, DNV and ASME design codes, very relevant to the understanding and appreciation of the nuclear power industry. He first started blogging and Facebooking in 2011 and for the last 12 months or so has concentrated his social media efforts on GE Hitachi's BWRX 300 small modular reactor and has a Facebook group and blog of the same name. Now, silly me forgot to press record until about 30 seconds into the conversation, but I've no doubt that you'll enjoy what we have to say. So here he is, Colin Megson. And then in total, I spent uh, 54 years in engineering before I retired at 70 years old. And five of those years I spent with Rolls-Royce and Associates in Derby. Oh, yeah. And they make the nuclear reactors for, uh, for the UK's uh, nuclear submarine fleet. That's right. So I got an insight there. But after I retired, um, it was uh, sort of a couple of years in the wilderness, and then I uh, I tripped over a nuclear reactor known as a lifter. I don't know if you've come across that term, have you? No. No. Oh, oh, put the thing on the screen. Let me get rid of that. Do you want to leave with me? Um, yeah, well, it's a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which is a molten salt reactor, and it's what's called a Gen 4, a Generation 4 reactor, which are uh, very advanced reactors that will be coming in maybe within a decade, and they can burn all the nuclear waste that people worry so much about, so yeah. they'll actually yeah. get rid of all uh, of the nuclear waste problem, if you like. Wow. Wow. Um, but then I've moved on now, and my uh, current great interest, and only interest really, is in a, a small modular reactor. These are the sort of scaled down versions of the huge Inkley Point C type reactors. Uh, and um, these, uh, there's one being made by GE Itachi, GE, the big American yeah. company. I imagine you must have heard of them. Um, and it's called the BWRX-300. Now that's 300 megawatt, which is about a tenth the size of Hinkley. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about Hinkley, I presume you know it's, yeah. it's in the news yeah. often enough. So that's sort of 3,200 megawatt. But the thing is that you could build 10 or 11 of these small reactors at a quarter of the cost of Hinkley. So instead of costing 21 and a half million, they may cost sort of, uh, sorry, billion, they may cost about 5 billion. Now that takes them into the realms of being competitive with natural gas and a quarter of the capital cost or of, uh, of uh, onshore wind or even more uh, competitive to offshore wind and uh, also solar PV, which is a pretty pathetic 
form of technology in uh, in temperate latitudes where we are the capacity is exactly. about 11 percent so that's the situation i'm in now and i uh, i have a facebook group page for the bwrx 300 and also a blog for the bwrx 300 and every time i get a little bit of information through i uh, feed it um, to the general public uh, G. E. Itachi, um, for reasons known only to themselves, seem to hide their light very much under a bushel. You just get uh, the the occasional uh, news uh, news article about them. But um, yeah, I'm really enjoying life in retirement, um, blogging and just debating all this uh, uh, nuclear power uh, versus renewables because I see that just as an outright contest. The two don't need to live together. In other words, I, I fervently believe that when the BWRX gets itself into operation, the first one will be online in, uh, in 2027. I think that will be, be the beginning of the end uh, for all renewable technologies. So that's, if you like, quite an extreme view. But I see that happening. I hope I'm around to see it. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, so this BWRX three hundred, and I have seen your group. Um, who's who's behind this technology? Who's funding it? And and what 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 is it exactly um, that is specifically different around it that you believe it is going to change the way? Like you mentioned in the message that you sent me, that it is going to change the way back in the olden days, the way just normal combustible turbines uh, engines were, were, were created. Why, why do you say that? That's very interesting. Yeah, well, the, the, it's a very simple reason. It is the simplest and most cost-effective design of nuclear reactor that there's ever been. Now, GE, uh, GE Itachi, um, have built... Uh, I don't know the numbers, but dozens or scores of what they call their boiling water reactor, BWRs. Um, in fact, um, Fukushima was a boiling water reactor. Right. Or, or the ones that, if you like, uh, had the hydrogen explosion. Yeah. Um, and these are a scaled down version of that. Uh, and you could not, it would be impossible to, to design a simpler reactor. It is literally a kettle because the steam, uh, the, the, the boiling water is around the nuclear reactor where all the fishing takes place, generates the, the massive amounts of heat. And the steam that comes off the top is fed straight into a steam turbine, which drives a generator, which produces the electricity. So it could not, just could not be simpler. But the way it's developed, because it's a smaller size, in itself that, that adds significantly to the public's perception of safety because it cannot blow up like Chernobyl did and scatter radionuclides, you know, there would be um, the radioactive material all over the place. It's, it's much, much smaller. So that's a good starting point for extra safety. Um, and then it's, it's called passively safe because it, 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 doesn't have, um, it doesn't have circulating pumps, which are a big expense in, in uh, nuclear reactors. It's all done by natural circulation. So you can imagine if, if the heat is transferred by natural circulation, that if you lose power to the, uh, to the reactor, which is what happened at Fukushima, I don't know if you appreciate the details, but they lost all their backup power because the diesel generator backups uh, were submerged by the tsunami. Oh, my God. So that, that's, that's the basic reason why they hit all those troubles. Yeah. But this can't happen. This is a passively safe reactor. and The natural circulation continues. And this can go on for days and days at a time uh, for the, to allow for the emergency services to be there and everybody to be sorting out any incident that might happen. So extremely safe. So safe, in fact, that it, it falls into the category that the US nuclear 
Self-Regulating Commission, NRC, they've already nodded towards the Emergency Planning Zone, EPZ, uh, for these small modular reactors to be at the boundary fence. And these, the boundary fence of, um, of the BWRX 300, they, GE, GE Itachi, actually superimposed the area on top of Craven Cottage Football Stadium. <laughs> so wow. That's the size of it. It was for a presentation down in London recently. So they did it, uh, it just fitted inside Craven oh, Cottage wow. Football Stadium. So if I'm saying that 11, um, 11 BWRX 300s will give you the same capacity as Hinkley Point C, and it wow. will fit. Wow. It will fit on the same in the same area, but at a quarter of the price, or a quarter of the capital cost, I should say. That is incredible. Mm. And so this is being created, and they're looking to. So 2027 is significant. Why? That, is that the, the, when the first one will be created? Yes, and it has a two-year build program. Now, that is, as, as you can imagine, if you've, if you've kept up to speed with uh, Hinkley Point C, talking about six, seven, eight years, mm. and the, the cost of your capital for borrowing over that length of time before you earn a penny from the electricity is actually crippling. It cripples the nuclear, in, uh, the nuclear industry, really cost of capital well this is a two-year build program no no different to a wind farm or a solar park so the cost of capital penalty goes out of the window mm. so you can just compare the two on capital cost which as i say is a quarter of, of the cost of, uh, of wind farms uh, and then the although we have no fuel cost for wind even if you add the fuel cost in and the decommissioning cost to both of them and the operator, operation and maintenance cost for both of them, it's still the, the, uh, the, the overall cost for the BWRX 300 is still significantly different, significantly lower than the cost for an onshore wind farm. And of course, what you get from a nuclear power plant is 24-7 electricity, yeah. which we all yeah. want. Exactly. Whereas yeah. from wind, if you get the wind, you get the electricity. If you don't get the wind, you don't get the electricity. No. So um, This is the whole you, problem you know, with renewables. Everything, everything going for it. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And people, they might be shocked. I'm, I'm a little bit shocked to, to hear that we're actually so close to something like that becoming you know mainstream and and the, the, that the technology exists right now um obviously you've got special interests that are alive that are going to influence how prolific this is um sent around the world so what are you aware of in that realm uh, it, it is really strange, but it is spreading, if you like, around the world, because that first one is likely to happen in Estonia. Okay. And then we've got this peculiar situation where we've got a Polish billionaire who owns an empire of what might be called high-intensity energy-using businesses, tyre manufacturing, and it is, I think is one of his mainstay businesses. And he is expressing an interest in the second of these reactors, which might only be a year or two later. So by, the, by 2030, they'll have the experience for the first of a kind and then maybe another one or two built. And then the, uh, what you call the nth of a kind coming off, if you like, coming off the factory production line the costs will be dramatically reduced yeah. and that's yeah. where, where it will start making a, a significant impact. Now, the, the beauty of this, um, of this size of reactor is that all the forgings for the reactor pressure vessels and all the machining capacity necessary then opens up because for the big reactor pr pressure vessels and all the other pressure vessels associated with nuclear reactors, 
there's only a couple of suppliers in the world who can supply those, mm. so, so they can really ask what they want. Uh, whereas with these smaller reactors, it opens up the competition, and that's why you can get significant savings in in forgings and and machines. Uh, and the thing is that I I, I feel fairly confident that GE Itachi would allow us in the UK with our vast nuclear experience to manufacture these under license in the UK, which would of course, you know, open up our engineering industry to a market that we haven't seen, the likes of which we haven't seen in decades. Yeah. So that could be very, very influential in the way people um, consider the BWR Has there been uh, any political interaction with um, people in, in, in involved in politics over there in the UK? Have you been in connection with them? Do they know? Are they up, informed about this stuff? I imagine they're not. No, not very much. No, no. It's, it's, uh, it, it's just so difficult trying to get in touch with MPs. I mean, I, I must have sent a thousand emails out to, to MPs at different times. Um, but you get the response back. I've had two or three responses, maybe. But you get the response back. that send you a postal code and your address. And if you're in my constituency, I'll talk to you. Otherwise, forget it. So that's an issue. But I've written to, I've written to uh, BIS, the Business Engine, uh, Enterprise Industry. Um, um, uh, people in the in the uh, hierarchy of that, the Secretary for Energy and what have you, and I've written to the Prime Minister a couple of times. I've written to the National Nuclear Re Laboratory about things, and you know, I just try to keep the ball moving and some hoping that somebody somewhere will take a little bit of notice of sometimes. I certainly I, I'm a member of the Labour Party, and I certainly try to influence what uh, the, the Labour Party policies before the election to. Uh, because they're going great guns for massive uh, build out of renewables and it's just what it what it is in fact is money out of our pocket because if you if you spend all that much more uh, in capital costs on these uh, dilute forms of, of, uh, of generating technologies you take the money out of our pockets and of course everybody talks about green jobs so the money's going into green jobs which uh, builds up the, uh, the, the capital cost. But in taking it out of our pockets so that we're paying more money just to boil our kettles, mm. it takes away our lifestyle choices. Mm. I might want to spend that money on other goods and other services, which would create the jobs that, uh, uh, with the money being spent on green, green jobs, in inverted commas, uh, which is is uh, you know just money a, wa a waste of time and money as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, it's very surprising <laughs> for yeah. me to hear that you're part of the Labour Party <laughs> and you have that sort of uh, <laughs> economic sort of uh, knowledge. That's that's surprising. It's maybe old well, Labour more so would would be aware, yeah. but the new Labour people <laughs> I don't think are so much interested in economics. Well, it's, uh, I suppose coming from uh, three generations of coal miners, it's, uh, it, it leads you in that direction. Yeah. Not particularly, uh, I'm not particularly in favour of the way the Labour Party is uh, going at the moment, but uh, I, I like that, the comfort of that middle ground, you yeah. know, where you can't tell a lot of difference between, <laughs> between, the, between the parties. But anyway, that's another, another subject. Yeah, but it is very important. So I don't know that 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 whole conversation is a variable in how popularized this gets because you know you have more green conversation coming from uh, let's call it that middle ground labor uh, coalition yeah. there, uh, but the conservatives mm. obviously and. Um, people on on who tend to be on the right are more interested in the economics and i imagine are yeah. very much more interested in what you are talking about here and they're probably the ones yeah. that are going to open the door to conversations about you know this will cut costs let's uh, let's let's have have some conversations 
yes. I'm sure you're right on that, yeah. So um, I may have to support <laughs> a conservative policy that really gets behind uh, nuclear power to a good extent. Yeah, and, and that's uh, where what we're doing with the uh, British Conservation uh, Alliance is we're trying to create a new narrative and really wrestle the narrative back from all these um, sort of, you could call them, <laughs> I don't know what you could call them, but they're, they're leading us in, in a direction that they may not realize that they are leading us, this renewables and this sort of, mm -hmm. it's become a kind of a cult that yeah. they want to lead us down right. into renewable, greeny land and, you know, carbon neutral, which I think is, is, yeah. is misinformed to be charitable, mm. I suppose. Yeah. Well, it's uh, Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg. They, they think there is going to be a level of catastrophe that's not supported by the, the IPCC's scientific evidence. But nevertheless, if you like, a group of frightened people who are, who are trying to panic the world into taking... Uh, excessive action, but what what they don't they don't have a solution. They're not going. Uh, they, they they do talk more about renewables and hardly anything said about um, nuclear power. But what they must appreciate is that uh, capital cost has has this dark side to it. So if um, if a, a BWRX three hundred costs a quarter of uh, uh, a wind farm of any size, uh, what it means is that in that wind farm, the capital cost tells you what's gone into it. It tells you everything you need to know about what's gone into that. And what's gone into it is 10 times more steel and, uh, and, and metals mm -hmm. per mm -hmm. unit of electricity that's generated and 20 times more concrete and stuff like that. Now, what that means is that for every extra ton of steel or other metals that you use, there's the mining, the quarrying, the transport, all fossil fuel transport, uh, all dis uh, environmentally destructive uh, before you get to generating a single unit of electricity. So you put the things up and you put them on land areas that are a thousand up to three thousand times the land areas for a wind farm or a solar park uh, than than a tiny little nuclear reactor plant and people may say well you know the wind turbine doesn't take up much space and blah 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 but every time you dig a great hole in the ground and you 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 uh, you quarry the rocks that are needed for all the roads and everything else and the base bases of the wind turbine, you're destroying natural ecosystems. And it's the it's been just the, the history of mankind from the hunter-gatherer times uh, that we just destroy parts parts of the planet and ecosystems. We don't know if we're actually destroying species that we don't know about yeah. by yeah. Doing things like that. So the environmental cost as well as the capital cost uh, needs to be considered by these uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion people and Greta Thunberg. They ought to be looking at, uh, at actually compacting the environmental footprint of humanity to get the most energy out that we can, that we all know we need and we can't live without. Uh, that, that footprint ought to be as microscopic as it can possibly be made. And nothing will do it any better than the BWRX 300 or other nuclear power plants. Yeah, it's really exciting to hear you say this um, because I I don't know why I had this impression, but I did have the impression that we were maybe decades off uh, realizing this type of nuclear energy and this type of a, a reactor being real because you hear so much scare stories chernobyl as you mentioned uh, fukushima uh, those types of events really poison the nuclear brand if you will and people don't have much faith in it 
and it, even when I'm passively having conversations with people that I I meet, and you mention nuclear energy is the is the way forward, it's a it's an emotional reaction. They've they've attached uh, massive skepticism towards nuclear energy. So, what would you say, if you had the chance? Let's say that these people are all going to be listening to to you. What would you want to say to them, and to 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 release them of their their fear. Well, what I would say to them is, uh, and nobody blames the general public for this at all, I certainly don't, is that you are headline educated. No more than that. The ordinary person has got a life to lead and he doesn't want to bother himself with all the minutiae of, of, of where his energy comes from when he flicks the switch. So there we are. If it bleeds, it leads. The media just puts it in front of us. And it's a, if it's scary, it's great. Because it sells newspapers, it sells advertising. So the general public are headline educated. And it, it, because you can't see radiation, it is scary. But the top communicators in the nuclear power industry all they seem to do is put forward this statement about nuclear power being the safest of any of any form of generation technology because if you even if you consider some of the outlandish figures for deaths and, and, and uh, illnesses from chernobyl per unit of, of electricity generated nuclear power is an order of magnitude safer than, mm. than anything else even wind and solar uh, so uh, but but that doesn't seem to impress people but what you need to think of is that uh, with the likes of Fukushima, uh, not a single person has died or is ever likely to, to die from the radiation that was released uh, in uh, Fukushima. But I don't know how many people, 10 or 15,000 people or something like that were evacuated at the time. And there's been a total of something like 3,000 deaths, uh, suicides, people who were ill and what have you, uh, have died just from the effects of the evacuation. And I, I talk about that evacuation as, as the result of a, an unholy trinity. And it was the, the radiophobic people, the people who were petrified, the worst being uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott, an Australian. Uh, have you heard of her? No. Helen Caldicott, no, no. Well, she is an extreme radiophobic person, um, but because she's got a, a doctorate in, in medical sciences, she gets she gets so much airtime and media time. She's able to spread all this poisonous information. So the likes of uh, Helen Caldicott and uh, in uh, many more like her, along with the media who just love the headline mm. and screaming out, and then all those weak need. Uh, Japanese politicians who said, like, we've got to evacuate everybody. When the science was telling them that the safest thing to do was to leave people there, get them indoors, keep them out of the rain, stop them eating the, the, the food, uh, it, it could have all been handled so much better. There wouldn't have been a fraction of the problems. And of course, the Fukushima township itself has just gone to rack and ruin over what has it been eight years since the uh, since the accident happened so nobody wants to go back there all these tragic consequences of radiophobic nonsense just uh, uh, and the failure of the politicians to take notice of the science so that's what you get from uh, you know the media and the screaming headlines and why people are, are essentially afraid of of, uh, of radiation and nuclear power in general and then they talk about the nuclear waste what are we going to do with that it's got to be it's got to be buried underground for 300,000 years yeah. and then the, the conversation yeah. goes in the extreme direction of well mankind's only been on the on the earth for 150,000 years homo sapiens you know so who's going to be there in 300,000 years well, that's just a load of nonsense. I've mentioned the Gen 4 reactors, which will take care of that. They'll just burn the waste as fuel and produce electricity for us. 
But uh, what, what you can say about the waste as it exists now is it's the safest waste on the planet. It's all stored there, either in, in uh, cooling ponds or in dry casket storage. It's just waiting for the solution to happen. The solution will happen. And it doesn't trouble anybody, not to the slightest. Whereas if you consider uh, solar panels, and if you put the quantities together, they're absolutely mind-blowing. If you consider the, the number of solar panels that are needed to produce the same amount of electricity as a BWRX 300, You'd be, if you put them on a, a a football pitch, spread them over a football pitch, they'd be sort of two or three hundred feet high. You know, that's what you've got to get rid of. And they would have to go into landfill. Uh, I mean, people will say about um, recycling them, but there will be a real significant cost of recycling solar panels. So the odds on they'll go into landfill. And what it means is that you've got that you then do have genuine toxicity problems with, with what can leach out. There's, there's a, quite a large uh, tonnage of, of lead in the amount of solar panels that I've mentioned. And that can leave the ground. There's all sorts of issues with, with pregnancies and, and young yes. children. Yes. Yeah. So they are, you know, they are genuine problems where there's the nuclear waste is sat there harming nobody until the solution lands, which is only maybe one or two decades from now. That is fantastic. And this this is not popular, right? What you're saying here, I have to admit that to me is new information. It's fantastic information, but it is new information that a lot of people are not privy to. And what and you say it so nonchalantly that I'm like why are we not told this? And why is this? Why is this? Uh, because the Fukushima story, yeah, I have to admit, I did drink some of that Kool Aid, and I did believe that all the water that was coming from the the cooling pods was so toxic that all the marina and all the wildlife would be dead. It would be an inhospitable place because of the radiation fallout. So I have to admit that I did believe all of that. But you're saying that that's not true. That it's hype that is created. Yeah. Uh, yes, if, um, what's she called? Dr. Dr. Jerry Thomas. That's uh, Jerry with a G. Jerry Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S. If you just Google or YouTube her for a couple of her takes on Fukushima, um, she tells you what the science, uh, and in actual fact, this lady is, is, if you like, one of the most knowledgeable persons about uh, Chernobyl as well, because she's responsible for the, the tissue bank. These are sa sam tissue samples taken from people who were exposed to every sort of level of radiation from Chernobyl, you know, from the, uh, from the ones that we saw in action in the Chernobyl uh, uh, document, or the film, I should say, mm. you know, that, uh, from the ones who were exposed to massive amounts of died of radiation sickness and what have you, right through to people who were living hundreds of miles away. So she was um, responsible for uh, collecting and collating all this evidence from tissue samples as to the effects of the Chernobyl disaster. And then she, she goes on, she's visited Fukushima several times. And I mean, she always makes the point that she gets, uh, I don't know, 10 times more radiation in the flight going across yeah. From, the, from yeah. this country to Fukushima, then she'll get when she's actually stood near the uh, near the plant itself. So, you know, give some indication of how nonsensical the the hype can get, um, and this water business up I mean, an absolute absurdity. The the radiation, the, the radiation count, the becquerels, the yeah. the yeah. radiation decays every second. Uh, is minuscule, absolutely off the radar. You would never notice if they tip that into the ocean tomorrow. You would never notice. Uh, uh, you'd never be able to measure the difference that would that would uh, take place within the the ocean environment. It, it's just a complete nonsense.
Well, that is <laughs> relieving to hear because the the media did uh, send out scare stories and. I have to say that I did believe some of them. Obviously, I wasn't privy to a lot of the science, but I'm 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 glad to hear that somebody in the know was uh, revising my my former opinions. Mm. That that's very interesting. So, like, I'm I'm really interested in helping people get more educated on this because you know what we're doing in the BCA is is we're trying to change the narrative because the narrative has been owned by some of those uninformed opinions and we want to change that narrative to help more free market nuclear energy friendly more real green solutions to environmental problems mm. you mentioned some there about the problems of renewables and 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 wind and solar and i don't think people are aware of that so i imagine that you write a lot about this in on your blog yeah where can people find your blog yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the uh, I've, I've run several blogs over the past, but um, the one I'm running currently is uh, the BWRX-300 blog post. I mean, if you just put BWRX-300 blog post into Google, it will come up with, with it straight away. I will add that into the into the show notes and uh, people will be able to 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 go there themselves. Um, is there anything else that you would like to make people aware of that, you know, the media might have put out there that you, you know, is just lies? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think because of the, I won't call it power, but the influence that Extinction Rebellion might be having on politicians, because they they run scared from stuff like that to the politicians, but the influence they might be having. What needs bringing home to them is this capital cost argument that I've mentioned. And if something costs four times more, then there's four times more environmental disaster behind that. Four times more mining, quarrying, transport, yeah. uh, the processing. If you can imagine it, the processing of the um, of the materials, the manufacture of the steel. It's energy, energy, energy all the way. And all these fallacious green jobs that are taking money out of my pocket so I can't spend it on what I choose to spend it on. That would be the big argument. And on top of that, of course, we've got to highlight the safety of these small modular reactors. And the fact that the Emergency planning zones are just at the boundary fence. I didn't mention it, but that's compared with what you might term big nuclear around Hingley, where it will have a 10 mile radius emergency planning zone. So if you can imagine the size of that compared with um, Craven Cottage football game yeah. that we're yeah. talking about. So if the, the safety, the safety issues, in fact, I think, um, have you come across Dr. James Conker in Forbes, C-O-N-C-A? Um, well, he did an article about, uh, about the safety of small modular reactors and the fact that the USA's NRC, the nuclear regulators, uh, had made this statement about the boundary fence. And I copy and paste a little phrase that he uses. Um, uh, when I'm arguing the point, and uh, you know the, the the end point is that you can uh, you you could more or less picnic outside the boundary fence and watch all the emergency services going in and, and watch what's happening inside yeah. of the little yeah. uh, little nuclear power plant. That's how safe it is. Wow! So the safety and the the capital cost issue. Yeah. Yeah. That and and to be honest, you know those those arguments are not made. Uh, in the mainstream so you know it's good it's good to hear you say that and I will link to your blog posts and you you mentioned you also have a Facebook group where you talk about these things is is that something that you would invite yeah, more think, people to to come along and become informed yeah I, I mean I, I, it's probably been going a little bit above 12 months and got nearly 200 uh, members group members if you like so it's 
and it's it's escalated quite a bit. I got uh, I got a German gentleman interested who put it on his Facebook group page and got dozens of uh, of Germans and uh, Europeans, other Europeans uh, joining the group. So yeah, it's, it's worked pretty well at the minute. And it is just BWRX three hundred. If you put that into a Facebook search, it will just come up with that group. You'd be very welcome to join, Rob. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, would you be um, available to talk about some of this stuff if, if students were interested in reaching out to you to learn more about this very specific topic? Would you be available to, to give it a talk? I don't know whereabouts in the UK you're actually located, but would that be a possibility? Uh, yeah, I'm located in Leeds. I'd, I'd love to give, uh, yeah, I could, do a, I could do a PowerPoint slide presentation. Uh, I, I can manage PowerPoint to a degree, so I could do that. That wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I'd love to give a talk. I, In fact, uh, all those years ago, what would it be, about eight or nine years ago, when I first got interested in this lifter, liquid chloride thorium reactor, mm. I did give um, a, a, a PowerPoint presentation at a two or three Café Scientifique uh, oh, locations. So that that was uh, very enjoyable. So I would enjoy doing something like that. Absolutely. Like when I when I release this, I'm sure that there will be people very interested in what you're saying, because I I know there's definitely people out there like me who would have drank some of that Kool Aid and believed uh, some of the media uh, misinformation. Let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, that's that 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 is fantastic. I really want to thank you for for joining me today because. Um, Obviously, when you reached out to me, I was like, would you like to speak to an 81-year-old person who's very interested in <laughs> nuclear power? And I was like, absolutely, bring it on, because I think the world oh, right. needs a lot more of this information. And you definitely sound like you, you've, you've obviously been in this industry for your whole life, so you're well-informed. Yeah, well, and I've never been as enthusiastic about a reactor as the BWRX-300, so... I'm hoping to keep that in front of people uh, for as long as I can. Absolutely. I hope I manage to see the first one switched on too. <laughs> oh, I've no doubt. I've no doubt. Um, I w I'll link the, the Facebook group and your blog post below and people can get in touch with you. Is there any other way that you'd like people to, to maybe get in touch with you? Would you like me to add your email? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Okay. I, 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 I've spent, I spend more time on uh, Facebook and, and blogging. Awesome. Yeah. Listen, Colin, thank you very much for, for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, very welcome, Rob. Yes, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed.